The Real Health Podcast brought to you by Reardon Clinic. Our mission is to bring you the latest information and top experts in functional and integrative medicine to help you make informed decisions on your path to real health. Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Ron Henning Hockey. I'm the Chief Medical Officer here at the Reardon Clinic. And we are delighted today to have on our podcast, Megan Lyons. So, and you've got an actual is it a show called The Lion Share? It's a company called The Lion the Share. Company. Yes, my podcast is called Wellness Your Way. Okay, wonderful. Well, we're excited because Megan is double uh, double boarded in clinical and holistic nutrition. She's a nutritionist. And you've been yes. doing this for 11 years. Yes, it feels like just yesterday that I left my management consulting world behind, but this is where I meant to be. So the 11 years have been lots of fun. That's great. Today, we're going to talk with you and try to answer the question, how can I, meaning each one of us, take better care of my own brain? Uh, so evidently, brain health is one of your areas that you've been especially interested in. So tell me a little bit of background on that, and then we'll jump in on some of the things that people can do to improve their brains. Sure. Well, I've always said my brain is my favorite organ because it lets me do and enjoy all the things that I want to do. I love learning. I'm getting my fourth post-college degree right now because I just can't stop. I keep going and going. And also... It was a question that I kept getting asked very frequently because people feel disconnected from brain health. They feel like, ooh, Alzheimer's or dementia or cognitive decline is just something that hits you and you don't have any warning signs and you can't do anything about it. And I knew that was wrong. So for those two reasons, I really dove into the research of brain health and I'm excited to share some of that today. Yeah, so people feel helpless when it comes to their brain. It's like they know it's like almost the most important thing. Of course, your brain couldn't be the brain without the heart, without the gut, and all yes. everything's connected. So when it comes to thinking about how do I take care of my brain, I think the answer is you just take care of your whole body. And uh, what are some of the things that especially, though, link up to the brain? Absolutely. I agree that general health is brain health. So for your average listeners who are not average in terms of their health, they're above average, I know, they're already doing many great things for their brain. But I like to start with what we add in, start with what we prioritize. And a lot of these are really rich antioxidants and phytonutrients that we get from all kinds of whole foods. Every little vitamin and mineral has a function in the brain. And we could take, you know, 89 different supplements every day, or we could just focus on getting a really broad array of phytonutrients from our food. So that's where we start. A lot of, um, a lot of great quality vegetables, fruits, whole foods in general will give us those phytonutrients. And then having adequate protein, which really helps uh, our brain in terms of uh, stable blood sugar, in terms of just healthy function overall. And healthy fat is essential for brain function. If we took out the water, which I don't recommend anyone try, our brain would be mostly fat. It requires a lot of good healthy fat to function. So we can start there just by focusing on what to add in. And then I can move on, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. First. Well, uh, one of my favorite books is called The Color Code. And the authors basically said, if you want to get phytonutrients, eat healthy colors, uh, namely... Yes. Uh, may, maybe look at your plate and do you have at least three, maybe five colors on your plate? And if you, if you can get, eat, and they, they suggested five a day is what the government has said, but they suggested nine to 10 colors a day would do a body good, especially your brain. So that's yes. one of the key things. I totally agree. I recommend eight to 10, but hearing that I might have to bump my recommendation up to nine to 10. I like that even better. <laughs> And I have a handout for my clients, which I initially designed just for kids because it's like a rainbow. I thought it was a fun game, but now I use it for adults too, to check off all the colors that they can get in a day. 
it's really amazing that even for people who feel like they're getting a lot of vegetables, we tend to not get that big spectrum. People, maybe they like carrots and sweet potatoes and cantaloupe, or maybe they're getting a salad every day, which is great for leafy greens, but it's rare that they're getting a, a broad array of colors. So you're really saying eat the rainbow. You don't want to get just one color, but you want to get six, seven different colors in addition to two or three of each. <laughs> Absolutely, so, yes. So great. Hey, I thought of something when you were talking about oils and, and maybe we could touch on this, that uh, the there's too much omega-6 seed yes. oils coming into the diet, especially from uh, fast foods and restaurants. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because those are devastating to the brain and to other parts of our body as well, of course. Absolutely. So the three primary omega fatty acids that we think about are three, six, and nine. And we actually do need all of those. So if we took out all omega sixes from our body, that yeah, would not be not good. good. Right. But the problem is our ratio is way off. So some people suggest a ratio of four to one or something like that. The average American is consuming more like 40 to one with omega six to omega three. So we're really out of balance. And the omega-6 is more inflammatory. It can create oxidative stress, neuroinflammation, which is brain inflammation, which can lead to some of those more chronic conditions. And the omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. So again, we need both. Inflammation has a, a purpose in our body. And if you sprain your ankle or whatever, you need inflammation. But the abundance of omega-6 is just making us uh, have systemic inflammation that's out of balance. And that can be felt if someone has brain fog. They kind of feel puffy, bloated. They don't recover very well. They might have swelling like ankle edema, something like that. These can all be signs of excessive inflammation and maybe the cause is omega-6. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then you, let's see, we talked, what about protein? Uh, you know, there's, there's been so much discussion about protein. What's the best kind? How much do we need? There are some people that are even going carnivore where they're, they're just all protein. What's the right balance of protein and what's, what are some of the best places to get it? Yeah, I really do think this depends on the person. Hmm. I have never personally recommended the carnivore diet Although I can imagine in some very, 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 very extreme digestive conditions, I've seen anecdotally that that can help for a short period of time. But for me, it's a big thumbs down for most people because we're missing out on those vegetables uh, and other kinds of healthy foods that we can get that are not just meat. That said, I do think I, I work with a lot of high stress, busy people who are trying to be healthy, but they're on the go. And almost always, they're not getting enough protein for their bodies. Protein is so important for muscle recovery, muscle synthesis, for just feeling full during the day. It's critical for uh, in so many functions if we look into all the different amino acids, which are like building blocks of protein. So I think the, the standard recommendation of 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram, it's way too low. Hmm. I will definitely recommend people get much higher than that, whether they're getting it from plant or animal protein. And for some of my clients who are more, they're very athletic, they're looking to build muscle, I might even go as high as up to one gram per pound of body weight, that has to be in an extremely active person. But for most people, it's somewhere in between there. And in terms of where we get that, which was the second part of your question, I think it's possible to get it from purely plants. I think it's possible to get a lot of your protein from animals. But if you're going to get it from purely plants, you have to be very careful about appropriately combining. And that's a lot more work than most vegetarians are doing. On the flip side, if you get it from animals, I do think we need to be very careful about quality. Right. Your McDonald's burger is not the same as your pasture-raised chicken breast or your grass-fed filet mignon. Quality really matters for animal protein. A little sidetrack in terms of protein is the quality of one's digestion. Because if you yes. are on acid blockers or if you are 
eating erratically um, and you're upset, you may not be breaking down your protein into the individualized amino acids. And without that, your body can't recombine them in order to make digestive enzymes and all kinds of other regulatory factors within the body. So how, how would people be alert to do a better job of digestion? Yeah, great question. I find in those people who are not digesting protein well, if they start paying attention to it, they almost always know because either they have that heavy feeling in their stomach after eating protein, it just feels like it's not moving. It's sitting there for a while because it actually is since they don't have the digestive enzymes to break it down or they may have diarrhea. They may run to the bathroom right after eating a big steak or something like that. That's again, their body's way of saying, I can't break this down, so let me get it out of you. So if that's the case, the very first and most simple and cheap intervention is to start chewing your food <laughs> super well. People don't do that. I know, we take your time, it. enjoy yes. the food. <laughs> I know, take some time, food is meant to be enjoyed. And I know we all live in 2024, it's busy. We don't have the same time we used to, but we need to be chewing our food, especially if we don't have those digestive enzymes. And then maybe next level, if someone wants to try something like apple cider vinegar, or they even if they're in a, a strong state of maldigestion, if they want to focus on more pureed and soft, like a a soup with a little bit of ground turkey in there or a smoothie with some protein powder in there just to ease their body back into it, that can be helpful. But I gen generally find for people who are kind of just not feeling optimal, they're not in an extreme state though, a little bit of apple cider vinegar or some bitters before a meal can really help. Let's, uh, let's add one more component to improving quality of digestion and getting it to your brain to help your brain. We, uh, we're, we've been talking a lot more about how it's not good to eat late in the evening because uh, you don't sleep as well. So yes. it's interesting that when we eat may be as important as what we eat. So how does that play into your thinking? Well, I think you're exactly right that it's all connected. I measure my sleep with several different devices and I notice if I do eat late at night, my heart rate is really elevated for the first couple of hours because my body is still working so hard to break down that food. And when that's the case, then I've basically lost a couple of hours of good quality sleep. And sleep is when our glymphatic system kicks in, which is basically like the janitor of the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it comes and flushes out all the waste in the brain. And when we do this, when we have the janitor in there, our brain is squeaky clean and operating really well. When we don't, we have more brain fog, we have more fatigue, we have more cravings the next day, which then it's a vicious cycle. Then we eat more sugar and less vegetables and the whole thing starts over again. So I'm not perfect. I don't say I, I've never ever eaten late at night but it's definitely something to prioritize. We're also working with patients who are asking us about the benefits of intermittent fasting. And one of our previous guests made a big point about finish your supper and then don't eat, not only for what you just said in terms of the quality of the sleep, but that gives you some time that sometime in the middle of the night, you're gonna shift into ketosis uh, if you avoid eating right after, or during your evening time. What would the value of that be? Because I've, I know people have heard about the ketogenic diet. This is not the ketogenic diet. Your body just naturally goes into ketosis if you haven't eaten too much too late at night. Why is that beneficial for our overall health? Yeah, great question. And I think I agree with your statement if you haven't eaten too much too late at night, but also if you haven't eaten too much then and the right quality throughout the day. So I can imagine someone who all they eat, and I, I don't mean to demonize any food, there's room for everything in moderation, but let's say someone ate 35 donuts during the day, but they stopped eating two to three hours before then. <laughs> Good point. They're still not going to get gonna have a, It's not going to work. <laughs> no, but assuming someone's eating a reasonably healthy diet during the day, 
The shift over into ketosis just means your body moves from burning sugar, which many of us do most of the time throughout the day. It shifts over into burning fat. And that's really great because many of us are looking to optimize our body composition and we could use the boost of burning more fat. But also that process produces something called ketones, which are really great fuel for your brain. I don't believe that most people need to be on the ketogenic diet all the time, but being able to burn fat and produce those ketones is a great thing. So here's another really interesting thing that just blew my mind. I've, I've given lectures on mitochondria in the brain, and there were estimates that in a typical neuron, there were 100,000 mitochondria. And I wow. just recently read, no, that's wrong. There's over a million mitochondria per neuron. So, wow. so help our audience think about what is it, what are the things that we can do to take better care of our mitochondria? What nutrients, what fats, what, uh, you know, exercise, what are the things that really help the mitochondria work better? Absolutely. You hit on several of those as you were describing it. So in terms of nutrients, the darker, the better, the dark leafy greens, the very deeply colored berries have great antioxidants. Any deep colored fruit or vegetable is very helpful. I will also throw in there for our mitochondrial health, we don't want blood sugar swings all throughout the day. That really depletes our energy. So if we're that kind of person, which is, is many people where we feel terrible until we get that coffee and then we slump and we get the pastry and then we slump and we get the sandwich or whatever all day we're on that roller coaster which depletes the efficiency of your mitochondria and then uh straining them in a healthy way like you said through exercise having them work what doesn't kill us makes us stronger that's hormesis and that works in mitochondria when they have to work a little bit then they perform better overall so if someone's not into exercising yet, even something as simple as going for a short walk after meals, doing a dance party around your house, just getting moving, and then you can build on it from there is super helpful. If we think about specific nutrients, I'll, I'll say those omega-3s, folate is super healthy for the brain, even probiotics because the gut and the brain are connected, which we touched on before. Magnesium is super important. There are many of these great nutrients that are critical for those mitochondria and overall brain health. Well, we're coming to the end of our session. This has been great. And so I was just thinking of what are some one word things that we could leave the audience with in terms of improving uh, brain health through better eating habits. And so I'm thinking of the word fresh. Yes. Fresh. What's your thoughts? I love the word fresh. The one that came to me as a bonus, because we didn't even dive into this, but it's breathe because we need yeah. stress management for brain health too. So if we can breathe, oxygenate our cells and lower our cortisol through the day, that's incredibly important for brain health. Hydrate, get Hydrate, enough yes, water. Absolutely. Because uh, if you don't get enough water, you won't digest as well. You can get stomach aches and you yes. need that. You need adequate amounts of water. So yes. we talked absolutely. about color, vegetables. vegetable, yeah, color vegetables, fresh. Uh, made with love. You know, a made lot of times love, the, the whole it. idea of saying grace is to yes. put yourself in the state of mind that you're going to really assimilate whatever it is you're eating in a better way. So to eat gracefully, let's just put it that way. <laughs> That's wonderful. I like that one. Okay. Well, Megan, it's been a pleasure to have you on our podcast and we hope maybe we can have you back sometime because we've got a lot of other good ideas here that we could cover. But in the meantime, thank you so much for what you're doing and your enthusiasm, your spirit. Keep it up, girl. So I will. Thank you, Dr. Ron. It's been so much fun. Thank you for listening to The Real Health Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. You can also find all of the episodes and show notes over at realhealthpodcast.org. Also, be sure to visit reardonclinic.org where you will find hundreds of videos and articles to help you create your own version of real health.